Today's American culture discourages competition. In an era when everyone wants to be a winner, we have lowered our standards to level the playing field. But history proves that competition leads to progress. What does the Bible say about competition? How do we recapture the spirit of competition in a society ruled by relativism? Can America get back in the game? Join historian David Barton with special guests Glenn Beck, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, and more as they explore the America our founding fathers envisioned. What if America's story is bolder, more colorful, and more compelling than you ever imagined? This is Foundations of Freedom. Welcome to Foundations of Freedom, where we look at our shared national heritage and we see things that we've just never been taught in this generation. Joining me today is Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. Michelle is a federal tax attorney. She's a very successful businesswoman. She's also a very successful mom. I mean, raised five of her own kids and 23 foster kids. She's also a member of Congress and she sits on the House Intelligence Committee and that's the one in charge of all of our national secrets. So she really has a very important post. Michelle, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. This is really an honor for me to be able to be here. I love what we're going to be talking about today. It has to do with what the Bible says about competition and how that provides for freedom for all of us. And I know there's a question that I've heard over and over, and I know you've heard a lot. Let's go to our very first question. A lot of Christians complain about socialism the Bible seems to support it. Acts 2 said all Christians held everything in common. So isn't socialism a biblical concept? So is that true? Socialism is a Christian well, concept? Let's go to the Bible verse we're talking about. It's Acts 2, 41 through 45, and I'll just read it. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And that sounds fairly Sounds socialistic. like a utopia, kind of a perfect environment. Everybody made sure everybody got what they needed. It all sounds like love, peace, joy, and happiness. And what do you think? The problem is that is not a government. That's a voluntary association of folks who got together to do something, and that's great. Uh, you have that with the kibbutzes in Israel. Mm -hmm. If they want to do that, that's mm -hmm. fine. But that's not what the government does, and it's not even what the church did because there in the book of Acts, it said they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So it seems like that all their possessions belonged to everybody. But then you find out Ananias and Sapphira, they sold their property and they only gave part of it. And when Peter confronted them over only having given part of it, it's interesting what he said. He said, didn't your property belong to you before it was sold? Mm -hmm. And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? So it didn't belong to the church, it didn't, didn't belong, belong to the, church, to the government, it belonged to, them. belonged to them. That's not socialism. Yeah. If it's in my control and if I can do what I want with it after I sell it, that's not socialism. And, and by the way, here's an old sermon. I mean, this is from back in the day. This is a sermon whacking socialism back in the 1800s. Uh, <laughs> here, here's one in the 1900s that was whacking socialism. So this has been a topic for a lot of time and there's a lot of people who say, oh, the Bible is, is for socialism and that's not true. And even our own American experience. Let, let me pull up a really big picture here. Let's take this picture. You see this on a regular basis. This is- I see it every day at the Capitol. It's in the rotunda. This is the embarkation of the pilgrims as they're leaving Holland to go to England and then on to America. They had the ax mentality because you gotta understand the pilgrims were one congregation. Pastor here has one congregation. He put half of them on one ship, half are gonna come later on the second ship. Well, the half that eventually came over in the Mayflower, he died before the second half came, the second half never arrived. So we're talking about one congregation here as the pilgrims. And their commitment is we're gonna help one another, we're gonna look after mm -hmm. one another. Same thing. All for acts, one, one all, for all. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, they get here and instead of arriving in Virginia where they thought they were going, they land in Massachusetts, way off course. Now, that was providential, it was a good thing because they started a new government. Mm -hmm. But landing as they did in December in Massachusetts, having no housing, no lodging, you're in the middle of a New England winter where you're having to chop firewood at an incredible rate just to stay warm, you're having to chop logs to build cabins for everybody. 
and I'm looking around and I don't think that little gal is going to be able to do just a whole lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that she will do much. I don't think that he will do much. Mm -hmm. uh, he's probably too old this to do one. just a whole lot. There's this children one. there, another children. lady there, another lady there. Mm -hmm. You got some white hairs. Now, he looks pretty rugged and he, he might can do something and, and he looks like he might be pretty rugged. And so we're now faced with maybe one fourth of these guys having to produce for everybody. And after a few weeks of chopping wood every day and going out and finding what you can, I have figured out that, you know, if I call in sick today, I still get the same amount. Everybody's going to share with me whether I do anything or not. And so human nature prevails. That's human nature, yeah. and that's the problem they had. And so Governor William Bradford talked about how the, they came to the point of non-productivity because mm -hmm. there was no incentive for them. If I work harder than anybody else, I don't get more. If I don't work at all, I get the same amount. And half died and that half winter. Died. They went from 102 down to 51. to 51. It was misery. And to try and figure this out, but it's that whole idea, again, of socialism versus you got to produce for yourself. And that's what they found. They found two Bible verses that set them in a different direction. In 1 Timothy 5, 8, it says, if you don't provide for your own household, you're worse than an infidel and died to faith. Whoa, time out. We're providing for everybody else's house. Our own household? So they have a town meeting and they divide up the property. And by the way, they bought property from the Indians at the price set by the Indians. One of the longest lasting treaties in American history between the Pilgrims and the Indians had great relations that's, with the that, Indians. That's an excellent point because the greatest example of race relations we had were these right. people, the Pilgrims, between themselves and, and the Indians. And by the way, the king said, it's my charter, it's my land, you guys take what I give you. They got here and said, King doesn't know what he's talking about. This is private property. And so whether it be the Pilgrims of Massachusetts, whether it be the Puritans in Massachusetts Bay Colony, whether it be Connecticut, whether it be New Hampshire, whether it be any of the religious colonies, they all came and said, no, nah, we'll buy the land. This is really important because everyone assumes from what they've been taught that all of the white Europeans stole the land they that they were on because the king just declared it was his. When it wasn't his, it was belonging to the Indians. And that's a huge, huge point. Now, the secular people came in and said, get off our land. The king gave us our land. You, you Indians get off it. The religious people. So isn't came that interesting? Said, it's very different. The secular people said, "Hey, we're going to take what the king gave us," and then disregarded the Indians and, and their rights. And these guys here had great relations because they understood equality. The Bible's created all many. As That's a matter right. of fact, the, the first load of slaves that came to America, we point to Virginia, Jamestown colony. The second load of slaves came to these guys. They freed all the slaves and imprisoned all the slave owners. And they did so looking at Acts 17, where the Bible says we're all of one blood. They looked in Revelation 7. And also 1 7. Timothy 1, 8, right? Where you look at evildoers. Right. And among that list of evildoers are slave, slave traders. traders. That's exactly right. And by the way, one of the documents we own, we own several of these, but one of them is an Indian treaty. And they said, Indians, you set the price. You know what it's worth. We'll, we'll pay the price that you set for it. There wasn't the stealing from the Indians kind of stuff. No, that's true. It isn't that all white settlers were good to American Indians. They weren't. That's but right. we also didn't but get the religious the, guys. The religious. Were the Bible oriented and guys. Why? Very different. And why? It's because they took their cues from the Bible. That's right. And what the Bible taught them about private property and also just equality of men. That's right. Because it isn't just citizenship. God calls us an equality of treatment right. with each other, male, female, whether you're Indian or whether you're European, Jew or Greek. Jew Jew. Or Greek. It's equality it of treatment. Bible's and again, even. going back to this concept of socialism and this idea about holding things in common and competition, it's really interesting how the pilgrims realized if we want to survive, not just be prosperous, yeah. but if we want to survive, we have to embrace a free market approach where each man puts his own That's labors right. out to be able to provide for himself well, that was and his that family. After they had the town meeting and, and divided up the land, they said, all right, everybody's got a piece of land now. Second Thessalonians 3.10 says, if you don't work, you don't, you don't eat. eat. Now you've got your own land, you go work it. Well, I've got an incentive to work really hard now. And socialism yeah. didn't work any better here than it did back in Acts because you had Ananias and Sapphira that still had their own property. But Peter so said- So we had a living laboratory. We had a living we laboratory. We had a living laboratory right. of a brand new country with the little bit more secular group that came over versus the religious That's group. That's right. Both tried to embrace socialism didn't work for either, for either one. One of, them. one of them was smart enough to get rid of it and actually embrace free markets. They tried to embrace free markets down in the more secular colony in Jamestown, but Jamestown just kind of couldn't make it. 
They removed themselves from Jamestown. They eventually moved up to Williamsburg and started mm -hmm. a settlement there. But it really is a wonderful compare and contrast between the two and also how the economics built up the societies versus tearing them down. Because socialism was killing them. Yeah, it was. Now that's what I think people need to get out of this, is that socialism was killing the civil society. It was. And we look at that today. Look at what nations who've embraced socialism, what's happened to those nations. Work. China, China rejected it. When, when Richard Nixon went to China and di with Deng Xiaoping, and Deng Xiaoping opened up the Chinese society, he saw, hey, I think I'd like China to be prosperous. I think we're going to embrace a market economy. It's not free, but it's a, a market, market economy. economy because he wanted economic growth. So as nations, including the United States, embrace socialistic philosophies and systems and bureaucracies, we're no different than yeah. any other nation. Then in those areas, then we go into decline yeah. as well. So we're not just set aside where we're going to be free of these consequences. If we embrace competition, we thrive. If we reject it and embrace right. socialism, we decline. And it makes a difference. What's our second question? Our second question. I'm gonna lay this on, on the ground while thinking. we do that. <laughs> I've seen some kids' sports teams that don't even keep score. They give trophies to everyone. I think that's so stupid. What is so wrong with competition? Oh, I agree 100%. <laughs> well said. <laughs> everyone gets the participation <laughs> ribbon. I totally understand. Is that the Bible or not? Well, let me go to one simple Bible verse. I, I was an athlete. I, I loved athletics. I loved competition. High school, college. Let me just read what 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. In other words, win. Run to win, you, not to compete. You be the one winner. There's 30,000 people in the Mexico City Marathon. Only one runs to win. Now, a lot of people just run to run, say, I ran the marathon. If you're running to win, your strategy, your tactics, everything is totally different. There's only probably 30 to 50 to 100 people that who really, really yeah. do it. But they're going for a prize. It's not everybody who finishes the marathon gets a prize. One person wins. And Paul says, you get competitive. You get aggressive. You be the one to win. Now, that's not let's all get a participation ribbon. And, oh, we don't want to keep score because we might make somebody feel bad. The Bible is in the competition. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Daniel was there with these young guys and they're in Babylon and they say, here's your diet, Daniel says, whoa, time out. We Hebrews have a different diet. Well, you're in Babylon. Hey, how about we have a competition? Let us eat our way, you guys eat your way, then you can test us and yeah. see who does better. And lo and behold, they all adopted the Hebrew diet because the Hebrew guys were doing a whole lot better than the and Babylonian it guys. Worked. And they measured. And see, that's the thing with competition, you have measurements of what works and what doesn't yeah. work. When you don't have competition, all ideas work. Socialism is great. Well, socialism is great if you don't measure the results. But if you start measuring the results of a socialistic system versus a free market system, socialism will lose every single And time. we have a lot of different metrics. For instance, like competition on educational attainment. Unfortunately, yeah. the United States has been woefully low on educational attainment. Singapore has been number one. If you look, for instance, since World War II, Japan was nearly flattened in World War II. South Korea was nearly flattened after the Korean War. But if you look at both of those nations, you can't believe how they built themselves up through competition. And the same with South Korea. They are very competitive. They want their children yeah. to learn. They want them to be number one in their class. When we set a bar this high, and we ask our children to reach that bar or for ourselves and the work that we do, that is biblical, that we are you to bet. try and you achieve bet. and we're try to try and succeed. And when we do that, we achieve so much more than we ever thought we possibly right. could. You know, even in the gospel, in Luke 19, we see competition in the parable where the owner gives money to his servants, the mina. And he says, take it an investment. And it's about $10,000, this mina. And then he goes away and some increase it to let's say 50,000 or whatever it is, and one does nothing, absolutely nothing. The whole story is about the fellow who did nothing with what he had, it was taken away and given to the most productive person. Mm -hmm. So the lesson is really, that is our call. We're not allowed to be unproductive. I guess you can choose to be unproductive. But you but, don't get rewarded. But you don't get and rewarded. you don't participate. That's right. That's Every right. one of them had that same mind to start with, and one of them did nothing. One had fivefold, one had tenfold, and there were 
measurements. This guy did That's really right. well, so we'll give him more. This guy did well. well we're gonna, and Jesus said, by the way, you did really well. You got five. You get to rule five cities. And you did really well and got ten. You get to rule ten cities, which are you kidding me? If you do really well, the Lord's going to put you in civil government? Yeah, that's exactly what, that was a reward. That was a reward. That's right. And we need to rethink what we think about, oh, government, politics, I don't want to get in that. Wait a minute. Jesus said, you did so well, I want you in civil government. See, that's the kind of people you want, those that perform and do well and are productive. And you mentioned choice, educational choice. You've actually voted for school choice, Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., the, mm -hmm. the voucher opportunity program. Mm -hmm. I mean, that mm -hmm. was a big deal to provide, because we've always been told that if you have competition, it brings everybody up. If you want better public schools, let them have to compete in the free market oh, with yeah. other schools. Oh yeah, in D.C., now you've got principals that go door to door, knocking on doors for kids, explaining why they're a better school. This is a great thing. You had one of the worst performing school districts, now they're forced to That's perform. Right. In Minnesota, we started the whole charter school movement in order to be able to get some competition so schools could perform. Personally, I believe that every and parent- And you were a senator in Minnesota. You helped do that back I, in the I, beginning. I did, I helped do that in the beginning, and I believe personally that every parent should be given a certain amount of money so that they can choose whatever school they want for That's their right. child whether it's a parochial school or a private school or public school, whatever they want they should choose they know their child best they should be able to take it's them. their child it's also their money by the that's way that's right and if you look at the scores of the united states versus international uh, scores of other nations we better hope we do something and quick yeah. because a study came out in 1983 called a nation at risk and that showed that the united states was falling woefully behind and even had the infamous line that said that if some other foreign power yeah. uh, was taking over our public schools and turning in this level of performance you would think they're taking over our country well that's 83 how many years has yeah. that been 30 some years it is high time that we bring in competition. And I love what you said about D.C. too, because you gave 6,500 kids in D.C. an opportunity to get out of the worst systems, and those parents took their vouchers and ran with it. And losing 6,500 kids out of the public school system oh, was- Oh, got a, some people to wake up. It was an economic slap. And they you said, bet. oh, we gotta compete. We gotta get those kids back. And so they started offering new programs and better academics, got rid of the worst teachers. And, and as you said, you got principals in DC going <laughs> door to door and I said, hey, come back to our school. We got great things going on. Boy, it's, it's great competition. You know, if you don't like a, a $2 hamburger on this corner, go over here and get one for a buck fifty, and then watch them go down to a buck fifty. And then these guys over here will say, well, we got one at a buck and a That's quarter, right. and you get more meat and bigger buns. It's but the concept of if you don't work, you don't eat is something that we know intuitively works. Yeah. I mean, we do that with our own kids. We don't give our kids everything. They have to work for something, and they're better off. But here in the United States, we've embraced a completely different view just in the area of food stamps. Yeah. And so now today, we have almost 50 million people that are on food stamps in a country of 300 million people. Now, why is that? Yeah. Why are we moving toward that model? It's, it is as though our government is embracing a system to put more people on dependency rather than freeing people. Because again, it goes down to happiness. People are happier if they can provide for themselves. Yeah. And so if we have a better level playing field where everybody can go out and with their hard effort, grow to be something, they'll be better, they'll have, they'll own something, own a home, they can give assets to their kids. The Bible says that, that leaving something to your grandchildren yeah. is, a, is to give an inheritance children, right. to your children's children Proverbs as a 13, benefit. 22. Wouldn't that be great if every inner city family in every inner city in America was able to do that, to hand something that's down right. to the next generation? We want this, that's and right. that's why socialism, as we've seen in the earliest stages of the United States, nearly destroyed us before we yeah. got off the ground. We've seen it destroy other nations. We've seen other nations throw off socialism and embrace freedom. Margaret Thatcher came in in England and decided we're going to the dogs here and she tried to move away from socialism and embrace markets and England built up. Again, it is biblical principles.
And for us, and, the same thing. And we, see, this is the thing about competition is it, it requires you to have measurements. And measurements tell you what works and what doesn't yeah, work. The yeah. thing about socialism is let's do socialism because then we don't have to measure anything. We can live with mediocrity. And you don't hold and your record, leaders accountable. That's it. You, you won't hold They're us as leaders accountable. We can be mediocre and you won't know it because everybody's got the same level of mediocrity. Now, that's right. We've talked about competition in economics, competition in schools. Competition in religion is really what birthed America. We were a huge believer that you get to choose your religion. Now, you, you consider, people think, well, that's not biblical. Time out. Most of us Christians have hanging somewhere in our house, Joshua 24, 15. As choose for me and my house, we'll serve yeah. the... Read the rest of the verse. The rest of the verse, Joshua says, choose you this day whom you'll serve. You can go back to the gods whom you served in Egypt, or you can choose the god of the Amorites in whose land you're about to enter. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. He said, you get your choice. Choose who you want. You want the Egyptian God? You want the, the gods of the Canaanites? Or you want yeah. God? You get a choice. You, you have the same thing with Elijah, it, with, with the confrontation with the, the prophets on top of Mount Carmel. Oh, I love this competition. It's this great. was awesome to see that he w he didn't fear it. That's one fear. thing about he Elijah. He called for it. He begged for and it. He said, oh, you guys down. want more time? Take, take more time. Take all the time you want. Just make sure I get my shot. That's and right. It, it's a, you had 850 prophets, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 false prophets said, you guys take all the time you want to worship, do what you want. And plus, I'll yeah. disadvantage myself. We'll pour water That's right. on my sacrifice. We'll do everything because he so believed in his God. There's only going to be one winner. That's Let's right. Compete. He knew now, how powerful his God, the God of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be. And God did prevail. He wasn't scared of competition. He no, brought it that's on. Right. That's and, right. And same with Jesus. Jesus didn't force anybody to follow him. He never, it's always been a wrong in history when you force people into a religion. When you, when you put them in a, see, when Christianity became non-voluntary in the dark ages, when we got away from the Bible and started forcing conversions, that is so anti-Bible. Can the we Bible just say that again? That is exactly what we believe. We do not believe that you force Voluntary anyone into choice. faith in the United States. We reject that. That's right. Jesus we said, don't force anyone whoever into Whoever wants to follow me. He said, right. whoever. If you don't right. want to, that's fine. Right. Now, this is an interesting set of books. This book, this comes out of the 1750s. This you have is, the best books ever. This Spirit is Spirit of Laws. This is Montesquieu. Exactly ah! right. Way to and go. he was quoted. He's the number one number most cited one. source That's by the right. founding fathers. That's right. Number That's one. right. Now, what he does in here, he says, let's let's have a competition between religions and see how they affect government. And I'm going to read to you uh, out out of what he said in, okay. in volume two. In volume two. He's looked at the Christian religion and the Mohammedan religion and other religions and... He compares Christianity, he compares Islam. And this is what he said. Christian rulers are more disposed to be directed by laws and more capable of perceiving that they cannot do whatever they please. Huge, huge, huge. huge. We are not a law unto ourselves. We are, not, we are a nation of law. laws, not men. That's uh, Christians right. Christians recognize there's a higher law. He says, while the Mohammedan princes incessantly give or receive death, the religion of the Christians renders their princes less cruel. From the characters of the Christian and Mohammedan religions, we ought without any further examination to embrace the one and reject the other, for it is much easier to prove that religion ought to humanize the manners of men than that any particular religion is true. It is a misfortune to human nature when religion is given by a conqueror. The Mohammedan religion, which speaks only by the sword, acts still upon men with that destructive spirit with which it was founded. It is absolutely amazing how true and how history repeats itself and how what Montesquieu wrote is exactly what we're seeing played out on the nightly news every single night. Because this is what we see. Montesquieu says that, that the Mohammedan princes, in other words, Islam, they incessantly, nonstop, give and receive death. That is how they've been throughout history. Yeah. Death is what they worship. Death is what they do. And that in the Christian realms, it is less cruel than the other. And that was when they had monarchs back then. It's even less cruel now that we got rid of monarchs. Now that we've gone to elective representative governments. See, this is back, Montesquieu was writing back when you had the king of England, the king of France, the king That's of Spain, right. the king of whatever. And even they were less cruel than the Mohammedans. And that's having the kings and all that they did. 
And that is the general philosophy that guides the manners of men and the government. That's what right. it says here, the Islamic religion, which speaks only by the sword, yeah. acts still upon men with that destructive spirit with which it was founded. That's, that was the basis of that faith. Whereas in Christianity, we don't kill people right. to, sh to, no to force to force you to be Christians. Now, did it happen in the Crusades? Yeah, it happened. When we got away from the Bible. When we got away from the Bible, that's right. But it, again, it shows how loving, how wonderful our God is, mm -hmm. that he wants to rescue us out of this cruelty. So imagine if the world and if nations and if the United States was ruled by Islam. Yeah. It, we would be a very different nation. Just as Montesquieu wrote, not us, yeah. Montesquieu, who writes again that this would be a nation that would be soaked in blood. That's what you see. And he didn't care rules. about the doctrines, he cared about the fruit. That's he judged right, about the fruit. Fruits. That's exactly it. And that's is the, the competition. It is the competition and it is the fruit of what we believe. There will be a consequence. That's right. There will be fruit, whether it is faith, whether it's the economic system you choose. In this realm, of competition that we're talking That's about right. today, you will have consequences. Consequences, and you need to for, those consequences. consequences for good or for That's evil. That's right. That's right. One of the two. And, and we go back to that beginning verse: run as though you're going to win the race. You compete. You be in, so. First thing to do is get an attitude of competition. Anything that says, I don't like competition, that's not biblical. You don't like competition in educational choice, that's not biblical. You don't like competition in religion, that's not biblical. Compete. Let the winning one come out on top. Do that with economics. Do it with political ideas. You hear two candidates debate, measure the ideas. Just yeah. because it sounds good doesn't mean it works. Measure the ideas. Measure the, so get into competition. That is a big thing that has to be done. Yeah, it's kind of, you could summarize it by saying get a brain. Get a I brain. mean, that, that's, that's kind of right. what it is. Right. Get a brain and figure out, don't you want to live better? Don't you want to be more prosperous? Don't you want to be happier? Don't you want to be free? Don't you want poor people to do well? Don't you want to love your neighbor? Yeah. If you want all those things, David, you would embrace competition would. with both arms and you'd want a biblical basis for your society, just like the pilgrims through their example gave us that they embraced for us, just like George Washington and the founders when they dedicated this nation to God at the inauguration, the very first seconds of life of this country. Competition worked politically, competition works in religion, competition works in economics. And competition is the foundation of freedom. Amen.